The program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to the middle of the South African bush felt. We're on Juma Private Game Reserve and you're joining us for your own privately guided safari. This is Safari Live. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this magnificent piece of wilderness. We're part of the 8.5 million acre Greater Kruger National Park and it's a great joy to be talking to you here from a little spit of land on the western fringes thereof called Juma Private Game Reserve. Uh, we are operating on probably about 6,250 acres and I may well be stuck in this tree. I am indeed stuck in this tree, everybody. There's a radio that's stuck in the tree with me, and uh, we're okay. My name is James Henry. On camera today is David Eastall. Hello, David. Hi, Dave. No, you're Dave. I'm James. He's forgotten his name. The man's quite out of his head. Right, on foot today we have Stefan Winterboer. He's wandering about with Jean Dre in the dreadlocks. Brian is uh, on camera with Brent. You've met him already. And also the diminutive and ultimately elegant antelope that is Jamie Patterson being filmed by The Hobbit which is Viam Dorenbrock. It's a great joy to have you with us. Please talk to us, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. For the next two and a half hours, we're going to be exploring this magnificent wilderness. Right now, Jamie Patterson is with Lions. And welcome on your live safari experience. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Viam on camera with me. And don't forget that because it is a live safari experience, that means you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now typically safaris don't happen in reverse. And that's because I wanted to show you something that is lying off in the bushes off to my left. Definitely not a sight for sensitive viewers. It is a half-eaten buffalo. An old bull that was taken down by the Nkuhuma pride of lions on the maybe about a two or so days ago. They haven't even managed to finish it off. Now, what I was trying to do was try and find you where the lions have gone. There are five lionesses with eight adorable little cubs lying just down, I think, in this river system that runs below the buffalo. And that would be a good place for them to hide. It means that the cubs are safe and secure away from any scavengers that might come looking for the buffalo. And at the same time, on this warmish afternoon, provide a little bit of shade for them. But I think on a day like today, here in the Sabi sand, it is incredibly windy. It's quite warm, but it is also blowing considerably and that has a tendency to make all of the animals out here a little bit more on edge, a little bit more nervous. While we go searching for the lions and where they might have placed themselves, I'm sure that Steph is going to be walking very, very carefully on this windy afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the bushwalk segment of this afternoon's drive and I am Stefan Winterboer and behind the lens today is Jean-Dre Gerding and it is exactly right, we are on foot in the middle of Juma Private Game Reserve, the exact same place where Brent and Jamie are coming to you from and where James is sitting in his tent and our mission today is basically to follow around this drainage line over here. We it's a windy day, so we want to get out of the wind because that is exactly what the animals are going to be doing. They're going to be getting out of the wind for the most part. Animals don't like wind. They rely on their sense of smell, their sense of hearing and their sense of sight. And two of those three are taken away when the bushes are shaking around and their senses are befuddled. And so for that reason, we've decided we're going to follow a drainage line, which is basically like a creek bed. 
and we're going to follow it down to its source and then along it see if we can pick up anything lying in the sand and any goodies along the way my favorite are all the smaller insects spiders and all the creepy crawlies and all the hairies and scaries and that is exactly what i'm going to be keeping my eye out to show you today as long as well as as well as i should say some of these keen survival tips and tricks that i pick up um, that I find quite interesting. Today I've got something special just for you. So keep on watching. I have got it in my bag waiting to show you a bit later. Now, the best way to move through the bush is to look for a game trail. And that is exactly what I'm going to be doing right now, is looking for a game trail to follow here. Obviously, game like these trails, and we're going to start there. But without further ado, we are off to James in his tent. Now you may be asking yourself, why on earth would a man at work have a cooler box full of drinks with him? He doesn't, is the answer. What he has here is a freezing box. And the freezing box is very important if you do not want to lethalize uh, the animals that you collect. Out in the bush, one of the characters I haven't introduced you to is Taylor. Taylor is a new presenter here, and she is basically fossicker in chief, which means she's looking for little things for us to view under our microscope. Now, we don't want to kill these things, we want to release them eventually, and what she has found here is a particularly interesting ant called Polyrhenchus, which I think is quite a nice name. Unfortunately, Polyrhenchus has re proved incredibly resilient to all forms of attempts to freeze it. And so we're going to try and get a view with the microscope of Polyrhenchus. Hang on a second, there we are. There is Polyrhenchus' abdomen. And the big thing to notice are those two spikes just before the ab abdomen. That's how you know this is Polyrhenchus and uh, not someone else. Now Polyrhenchus is actually quite a delicious tasting thing, believe it or not. Now I know that looking at this slightly astounding picture, isn't that a beautiful? Look at the incredible colors, black, copper, gold, honey-colored little hairs, and those two spikes. Look at the little hairs on the abdomen there. As I was saying, quite delicious to eat. Polyrhenchus' abdomen tastes like a lemon drop. So um, I don't think I'm going to eat this particular one, frozen and pleasant as it might be, just because it's a windy day and I don't really feel like a lemon drop right now. But you can actually take this very ant I'll show you. I'm not going to eat him this time. If you would like me to eat him, let me know. Hashtag Safari Live. There is a beastly wind blowing. But you basically put that into your mouth. There goes a snail shell. And it tastes like a lemon drop. It's actually quite pleasant. I've done it once or twice before. Uh, I've just had my lunch there, so I don't think I'm going to eat polyrhenchus today. We're going to release polyrhenchus back into the bush felt just shortly. Then... Of course, terrifying thing for anybody to have to see, especially if it crawls over your face in the night. Look at this, David. It is Kogolochi. You see that? Yeah. Now, Kogolochi, of course, the local term for a cockroach, Kogolochi. Terrifying animal. And what I'm going to show you, thankfully this one is dead, I'm going to show you the spikes incredible spikes on the legs. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Now those spikes help Kogolochi to climb up your wall when you're trying to chase him. They help him to climb on your ceiling when you're trying to hit him with your broom. And he's able to climb on just about any surface. Astoundingly magnificent. And also, look at the wings. Oops, that's the legs. There are the wings filled with little veins and those veins help the wings to stay stiff with hydraulic pressure. I think this is a quite a remarkable thing. Isn't that great? Okay, we're going to see what else we can find out here to put under the microscope. We're also going to introduce you to Ronald the Rover the next time you come over to us. Let's go and see what Brent Leo Smith is up to. Our wind is howling today. Now apparently Brian told me there's a front coming in from the coast. Now there's the thumb who is attached to Brian and of course my cameraman is Brian Joubert. My name is Brent Leo Smith. Sometimes together we are known as the Killer Bees. That's because we find all the good stuff and we're hoping to do that today and we're heading towards a water hole on Arethusa called Red Dam and maybe 
there might be some predators around there uh, possibly some elephants at this time of the day and it, it's about it is quite cool for this time of the year this, this wind is keeping the temperature down only about 27 degrees celsius uh, which is about 81 fahrenheit and i'm hoping that there's going to be lots in store for us uh, this evening as we wander live around the african bush and remember if you've got any questions for any of us please send them through and that's also in case you don't believe we're live so we can answer them for you and you can do that by using the hashtag safari live on twitter now in this area we're looking particularly for maybe two to five different leopards the dominant male leopard around here is tingana and he passed through Juma last night and quite often he likes to make a meander towards the red dam waterhole so always good to have a squiz around there there's a female leopard called shadow that also comes through this area and recently there's been quite a few sort of almost semi-nomadic young females trying to set up territory all over the place so they have been popping up from time to time so there's always a chance uh, that we might find one of them so fingers crossed if not not always about the big hairies and scaries this is literally an absolute wonderland of fascinating creatures birds bugs trees uh, all the way down to the grass and even the sand so hopefully we'll be able to find something to keep you entertained So as we travel through an area like this, you can see it's quite green, which is unusual at this time of the year. We are in our dry season. We're also in the worst drought in recorded history in South Africa. Now, most of these green trees are of one species yeah, called a magic guari bush. Now, it tells me that there is good underground water here. And they're not very very palatable so not too many species eat them although because of the drought the elephants have been eating them now i suppose one wonders why is it magic brian do you know why the gwari is magic i do know why it's magic oh do you know yeah. there we go brian's been on the back of the vehicle on many a safari with me might have picked up a trick or two so the main reason it is called a magic gwari is to do with some of its cultural uses and uh, it is a protection against witchcraft and in particular if you have been bewitched and someone is trying to kill you one of the means to kill you especially coming through to the summer months is to send a lightning bolt and how to protect yourself and your home from a lightning bolt just conveniently keep a quarry branch around brian i think we might need lightning protection there isn't a cloud in the sky yet but with this wind you never know so we'll keep our magic quarry to protect us not only from lighting but all sorts of bad spirits now there's also another reason it might be considered magic uh, it is used in water divining so to find water under the ground what you would do is take a much bigger branch than this one and you would carve it and in carving it you would then walk around with a forked stick and where it points downwards you put your borehole or you dig a well for water now fascinating enough we won't go too much into the latin and scientific names but in this case this one is called euclid divinorum and of course the divinorum comes from divining so not only is it magic but it's divine so we're about two minutes away from the water hole so we're going to stop start checking in the shade around here and just hoping that we're going to see a big cat slumbering also it's going to be quite difficult to hear any elephants at the moment but maybe they're having a drink because it is very dry at the moment and they do have to travel sometimes quite big distances between food and water now we do have many bird species in this part of the world but this wind will make it quite difficult but we will keep an eye out Okay, let's go see what's at the waterhole. Remember, we are 100% live. You are enjoying the middle of Africa at the exact same time as us on your 
very own privately guided safari and we're on foot we're in the tent we're looking for lions we're looking for leopards we're looking for everything that might be out here in this african wonderland okay here's the water hole let's have a peek oh there's a hippopotamus oh and he's got some friends who disappeared maybe some little terrapins on his back here we go oh, this is a male hippopotamus and the reason i know that is he's all on his lonesome in the bigger water holes where all the ladies are the big dominant hippo bulls will be residing so it's difficult to see when most of his body's underwater but this is either a particularly old man or a young man an old man who's too old to challenge for breeding rights or a young man who's not quite big enough just yet. And we do have some birds as well. Always nice to see some of our feathered friends. And a pair of blacksmith lapwings. And a cape glossy starling. Now the blacksmith lapwing we will always find associated with water. You won't find them far away. And although they're being quiet at the moment, they get their name from their call, which sounds like a blacksmith tinkering on steel. Dink, 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 dink. I think I'm going to sit at this water hole for a few minutes, make sure we haven't missed anything uh, while we do that. It seems like Steph's got some tricks of the bush to show you. All right, and I am almost ready to do the first part of my survival tip for this afternoon. What am I going to do with an egg and a nachi and some elephant dung? Can you guess? Well, let's see. All right, first we do is we prep ourselves a little fire. So I use my fire steel to set the elephant dung alight, which I'm hoping I do pretty easy here. It's so dry at the moment that setting elephant dung alight shouldn't be too much of a problem, although you never know with these things. Right. Elef Why am I using elephant dung? Because it smolders fantastically well. So I'm using a fire steel. There we go. We've got some smoke. That's all we need. Gently coax. Here we go. So we're gently coaxing. <laughs> we did it. Now, we let that burn a little bit. No, same. Now, while that is happening, I'm going to prepare my nachi. So, what we're going to do is cut it just off of center. A nachi, if you're wondering, is very similar to an orange, only it is a little bit smaller and tastes a little bit different. So, now we've peeled the top. Now, I'm going to take out a segment eat it and try and hollow it out which is not working like that but there we go we're gonna hollow this one out have a look over here taking out all the pips eating along the way it's important you know nothing goes to waste all right mm. I'll save some of that for later put it over there are you guessing what this is yet? Oh. No, you haven't guessed what it is just yet. Getting there. Alrighty. You're almost guessing it. Now, when you come back, I'm going to have some more surprises for you. 
we'll show you how it's going. Stay tuned. All right, now let's coax a little bit of heat. So, you've just asked, and new viewers just asked, hello, welcome to the show. You've just asked if the elephant dung stinks. No, it doesn't stink. It's made of wood and grass. It smells like a very woody fire, if I were to put it to you that way. Alrighty, I think I'm going to need to get another piece of elephant dung. This one is burning unevenly. So, we're going to light one fire with another one. And I think let's go for this one here. Because we need it burning in the middle so that our cup sits perfectly in the middle. But while I'm getting this fire going, we're going to send you over to Jamie who's got an update for you. We have tried valiantly to get around to these lions where they're hiding in this river system off to my left, but unfortunately no such luck. And that's just one of the realities of a live safari experience is that sometimes the animals don't do exactly what it is you were expecting them to. I have a feeling the Inkahumas have been unbelievably successful recently in terms of their hunting. And I have a feeling that there's a chance they might even abandon this buffalo kill to the vultures and the hyenas and the other scavengers. And the reason that I say that is because they had enormously full bellies when they managed to hunt it, when they first killed it. And now they've got even fuller bellies. And as a result, with eight little cubs to protect and look after, they might decide it's just not worth the risk of hanging around a kill. Let's go nice and slowly into here. And see if you can spot them before I do. I'm looking for flashes of tawny lying in the shade. Black tipped tails. sheltering from the wind. I'm just squeezing past some trees now. There they are. We can just see them lying up in the shade. Almost invisible despite the fact that they're not more than 20 meters or so away from the vehicle. Amazing how well they are hidden. It looks as though they're doing some serious lion sleeping hidden behind the trees. I'm going to do one more attempt at shifting the vehicle around and since that's not terribly exciting to watch, let's go over to the tent and the innumerably entertaining James Hendry. Hello everybody. What we're going to do quickly before we go back to TV to, for our special loyal internet viewers, let's have a quick look at the rover view. Very good. Well done. Rebecca's operating that with such pizzazz. And there is the rover view. Ronald is sitting very lonely. You see, he's now missing desperately his friend, uh, Henry the Hippopotamus. And um, I know that some of you were deeply offended by the fact that I called the Hippopotamus Henry instead of Peter the other day, because of course we used to have Peter in the pan. Um, I don't really mind what you call him, of course. And um, the thing is, he doesn't really mind either. Right, we've got 30 seconds back to TV and then I'm going to show you a flower after which I'm going to show you a little bit about the lions and the, where they live. Most of you will know where they live, of course. So now let me prepare this flower under the microscope so that when our TV audience comes back they think I'm slightly more professional than I really am. Good afternoon again and welcome back. It's lovely to have you with us. You are on a live safari. Do not forget, please talk to us. Hashtag safari live on Twitter. My name is James Henry. On camera is David, who has now remembered that he is in fact David. Uh, also out in the bush today, Jamie Patterson looking for lions, Brent looking for leopards, and Stefan Winterboer 
cooking an egg, believe it or not. Right, have a look at the microscope feed here. We've got a beautiful flower to show you. This flower is called the Devil's Thorn. Now, I can't imagine a flower that could possibly look less like it comes from the bowels of hell than this one. It's a stunning purple color. And what you can see there, the yellow bits, the male parts of the plant, and those slightly honey-colored little bits there are the pollen. And those pollen bits are just being deposited. Now, there is a nasty wind, as you can see. I think we'll maybe save that for a little bit later. I'm going to show you one more thing. Let's go back to the microscope now, if you don't mind. There we are. Now, those tracks, you see those tracks? Those tracks are actually reflecting ultraviolet radiation or light, and that attracts insects, which will in turn come sort of let use it as a runway and go into the flower and pick up that pollen that's hanging over the runway there you can see that and then as they make their way out again they'll go into another flower and in so doing pollinate it which i think is a rather brilliant idea now back to me please there we are come outside with me everybody let's not dally inside we're on a safari over here we have an exceptional piece of artwork as you can see david do you think this is an exceptional piece of artwork it is i think exceptional now i'm just going to show you a little bit about the lions of this area here we have the Inkahuma pride that's who jamie's looking for at the moment and i'm just going to get another colored pen and there are eight little cubs, you can see there. They're very beautifully illustrated by me. There are five lionesses. I ran out of space for them, but that's the Nkahumas. They're like that. Nkahuma is spelt like that. And their territory extends as follows. It's about eight, or it's about 6,000 hectares, which is about, you can multiply that by 2.4, and you get to roughly 13,000 acres. That's the Nkahuma pride. Then down on this little piece of land called Cheetah Plains here, we have the Styx pride. And the Styx pride is uh, three lionesses uh, and uh, six little cubs. Unfortunately, these cubs, David, as you know, have a pox. Yes. They've got mange. They've all got mange. There we are, that's their mange, and they extend in an area roughly like that, and it's about the same size as the Ugohuma Pride Territory. So that's the situation with the lions here. Now, I don't know about you, but it's nearing tea time for me. I wouldn't eat an egg for tea, but apparently Steph would. And... We are getting there. You can see our eggs starting to cook and bubble quite nicely. I must be honest, my eyeballs are starting to cook and bubble quite nicely as well. And uh, for those of you who have just joined us, we are cooking an egg in a citrus peel from a nachi on top of an elephant dung fire that are made with a piece of steel and a magnesium stick. And it's taking its toll, I must be honest with you, the smoke is absolutely ruining my right eyeball. But that's okay, I've got two, I don't need another one. As you can see, when you blow this fire, much smoke comes out. And it increases the heat, there are bits and pieces of wood inside elephant dung. Let me show you over here. And it's the wood, excuse me. <laughs> this smoke is insane. It's the wood that catches fire and gives you the heat. Have a look at that. It's also incredibly good for headaches. Apparently, there's lots of old wives tales about elephants, elephant dung fires helping for headaches. Oh, I'm gonna lose it. Now, as a reminder, everyone, this is live. And as you can see, Liz, you just asked me if this egg is going to pick up some citrus flavor. I'm almost certain that it will do, to be quite honest with you. I'm almost certain that it will pick up a slight citrusy flavor. I'm actually hoping for it because I don't have any salt or pepper or tomato sauce or ketchup here. Um, so I'm hoping it does. Anyway, I was just going to say, the flame seems to be getting okay now. We're starting to see a nice whiteness appear on the top of that egg. And um, while we're waiting for the egg to cook the rest of the way, you know, Jamie has got those beautiful lions. And we do indeed have the beautiful lions, but see if you can spot them. 
a beautiful afternoon here live from the African bush. The lionesses are really truly content to be in the thickest vegetation that they can possibly be in. Now, they are not more than 30 or so meters away from our vehicle and all they are is shapes of tawny hidden behind the leaves. They look as though they plan on spending a great deal of their afternoon out here. And that's just one of those things if you're going to do a live safari is that the animals are not always going to be cooperative. They are 100% wild and they do their own thing when it suits them. Now my name is Jamie and at some point I would really love to introduce you to the Inkahuma Pride for those are the lions that we have just a little way away from our vehicle. Unfortunately since they are playing hard to get we are probably going to leave them for now since we have such a short time that we can spend with you and show you all of the magical things of the African bush that we're probably going to leave the lions for now and hope that when we come back they will have decided to pop out and come and feed off their buffalo which is right behind us so you won't be able to see it at the moment hopefully they'll decide they'll have to walk out into the open to go and have some dinner and then perhaps they'll come out then there are cubs there there are tiny little cubs three different ages the oldest are no older than roughly about four months of age and I cannot wait for you to have a chance to see what a lion cub looks like. They are definitely one of the cutest animals out here in the African bush. But for now they're having a lazy Tuesday afternoon. That is all that they have planned and that's what they're going to be doing. We could try and outweigh them but nothing plays the patient's game like a lion plays the patient's game and they are absolute champion sleepers they can sleep up to 22 hours a day and with full bellies just imagine the biggest Sunday roast that you've had or perhaps a Thanksgiving dinner or maybe a Christmas dinner or a meal with the family eaten as much as you possibly can well these lions feel even fuller than that so that is what they plan on doing. I can just, just see, and I'm going to try and shuffle forward ever so slightly because I can see a little cub. It's one of the tiniest ones, it's one of the smallest ones. I also don't want to go over the edge of the cliff. That would not be ideal either. So we'll do this very slowly. Uh, oh, face. Look at that. <laughs> the head of an adult female see she's doing a marvelous job of dozing her eyes opening oh, hello girl thank you very much that's amber eyes now you shouldn't have favorites of course but if I did have a favorite lioness it would be amber eyes she's not there you go look there's a little one at the back just a little spotted face and back down just like Amber Eyes. She's not the mother of these little cubs. She is their aunt. And what a cool aunt she is. Whenever there's action, there always seems to be Amber Eyes right in the thick of it. I think we're going to leave our lions for now. Let them have their afternoon nap in peace. And we'll come back to them when it starts to cool down a little bit. And perhaps the stirrings of desire for a buffalo lunch is going to be exactly what they are in the mood for. And while we extricate ourselves from the thick and dense vegetation, on an afternoon like this afternoon, it's a very good place to be at the waterhole and we have a slightly different perspective for you. Now, everybody, the shot we're going to show you at the moment might give you the impression that there's a lot of water. Have a look at this. Now, that is water, of course, but it is pumped water. It was put there by human beings, and what I'm going to do is show you how very dry it is indeed. Oh, dear. Ronald seems to have lost control of himself. We'll have to uh, probably try and fix that. Uh, dear. Yes, I don't know how that works. Um, right. Uh, we'll have to talk to our Russian about that, our Russian will have to fix that. Anyway, there is a tremendous amount of uh, drought on at the moment. We don't have much water, 
at all. But there are plenty of little things living in the bits and pieces of dead stuff that we have around here. And although the drought has been not very good for the buffalo and the impala and the warthogs and the hippopotamus, it hasn't been too bad for one of our favorite characters here at Safari Live. And every so often we like to just have a quick peek into their home. This is my friend Jerry the giraffe. And uh, Jerry, as you can see, is long dead. Yes, some time back he was killed probably by lions, but in Jerry's nasal sinus, entering through the back of his cranium, we have a colony of stingless bees. Now look at that. You can just see the feelers of the little stingless bee coming out. Unfortunately, they are now a little bit reticent about coming to say hello to us. Come on now. Let's go back a bit and zoom in. There we are. Hello, Mrs. B. This is a stingless or sweat bee. And there's a little colony inside there. There's probably a small colony of, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 little bees. And this little waxy sort of tube or protuberance, they build when it's warm enough. And I think the wind, which has rendered the temperature quite chilly, has probably made them a little bit shy and perhaps also the thought that they're actually on television now has made them a little shy. Right, so that is the case with the stingless bees. I'm going to try and get Ronald the recalcitrant rover going. While we do that, let's go and find out what Brent Leo Smith has got to show you. Uh, there is one of the sweetest smells in the African bush at the moment and it's the flowers of the acacia nigrescens, the knob thorn tree. Now, what I'm really looking for around the knob thorn trees at the moment is some of the beautiful, beautiful sunbirds that we get here in the African bush. And they are proving a little bit difficult in this wind, but we will keep trying to find for you. Remember, this is a live African safari, and uh, we are looking for everything. We're looking for lion, leopard, elephant, and uh, I've been sitting at a water hole, unfortunately nothing came through. So we're gonna keep going. Oh, there's a beautiful bird. Remember, hashtag Safari Live for questions. Look at that. It's called a little bee eater. Oh, off he flops. It's gonna land again. Now they quite often like to land on the same perch or very close by. Now, they're called a bee eater because of course bees are one of their favorite foods. Now he's just here. You got him, Brian? And when they catch a bee or a wasp, what they do is they'll beat it against a stick and so it doesn't sting them. They're very busy little birds. Absolutely gorgeous coloration on them. It's the smallest of the bee eater species that we get in southern Africa. Isn't that absolutely stunning? One of definitely one of the prettiest birds around. And they're resident here all year, so they don't migrate anywhere. Oh, off he. Oh, we didn't go far, at least. I love that little sort of blue eyeliner. And it looks like it's a lady getting, getting ready for a night out on the town with some quite, quite serious makeup, that little bead. Hopefully, if we're lucky, we might catch some of the first of the other bee eaters that are making their way down from up Africa the, and even all the way from Europe. So the European bee eater likes to spend its time in and around uh, the, south of, the south of France on the Spanish coast. And then when it starts to get towards winter, it migrates down to spend its, our summer with us. So best of both worlds for the European bee eater. And they should be arriving within the next couple of weeks. Oh, this wind is a blustering. Wind. We are going to keep trying to find you anything that might possibly be out here. And remember, hashtag Safari Live, and one of us will do our best to ask, answer your questions. But we're going to disappear for a short while. But don't forget to stay tuned after the break because we might have more incredible creatures just like that waterbuck.
You know, beautiful big male waterback. I wonder if he's making his way down towards Red Dam to go have a drink. A nice, impressive set of horns in him. And I do love the shape of their nose. They're a wonderful little heart shape. I'm just going to move forward a skosh so Brian's got a clear shot through the trees. Oh, how's that, Brian? So yeah, you can see their nose. Does look like a heart. Well, if you've got a bit of imagination, which we do. And you can see that ribbing on his horns. Now, when they do fight, you can actually hear it great. I don't know if any of you have seen those wooden toys that you grate along the back to sound like a frog. When the two water bulls fight, you do get that And unbelievably, for this gusting, incredibly strong wind, the birds are actually being pretty, pretty nice to us. Here we go. There's a black-headed oriole when Brian's finished coming out of that water back. We can hear him calling. He's in the top of that tree there. Here he is. Another beautiful bird. We're getting the colorful ones out of the way today. A little beater, black-headed oriole. Very distinct red beak. He's also got a red eye. I think we might be a bit far. Now one of their favorite foods is our caterpillars and he's got one. I was, like, I was just about to say he likes caterpillars and then he finds one. It didn't take him too long to scoff at that. Oh, off he goes. Oh, he's back. Another one. He's got another caterpillar. Tiny little inchworms more. Well, they must be struggling as much as a lot of other things that eat plants with the lack of vegetation around. But, of course, there's always a predator for everything. And, uh, oh, he's really going at them there. And wait for him. And as he swallows that, James has got a creature who's about to go swallow some water at the Juma Pan. Straight to the rover feed, everybody. Straight to the rover feed. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the buffalo has left us. Anyway, uh, well, that was almost, we got it right there. Let's just zoom out. Let's go quickly back to the dam cam view and we'll try and show you where the buffalo went. But there was a buffalo drinking right with Ronald there and then he stuck his nose into the camera and unfortunately now he seems to have gone. Oh, oh, it was going to be so good, everyone. Never mind. He's gone down into the river there. Oh, well, maybe he'll come back. You can see him, can you? Oh, there he is. Yes, there he's moving around there. Good. Well, that's the buffalo. Uh, <laughs> while we wait to see what happens with him, let's head across to Jamie. She has a striped dressage pony. And for our internet audiences, you get a little bit of a sneak peek as to what is waiting for the television audiences when they do return once again. And unfortunately, our striped dressage horses, as Steph described them, giving us a very neat example of the walk across the road, the zebra crossing, ha ha. They are incredibly nervous though, and it's the wind. The wind is howling through and it's making them exceptionally uncomfortable. They're jumpy, the, the leaves are rustling, the wind is blowing, and all in all what that does is it means that they can't hear predators sneaking up on them. And as a result, they're constantly on edge. Imagine what it must be like for them to have to live that way initially. Luckily, though, they've all gathered together, they've got the safety of the herd, and those of you who are sharp-eyed would have spotted the impala that are moving about behind them, the most numerous of all of our antelope species. And I'm really hoping that these zebra decide to stick around and not disappear across into Buffalo's Hook. Here we go, that's better. Our stripy horses are relaxing. 
definitely feeling a lot more comfortable. You'll be able to hear the wind, I think. It's absolutely howling. And welcome back to all of you on your live safari experience. We're sitting right here on the northern boundary of Juma Private Game Reserve. The boundary between Juma and a property called Buffles Hook. Right across there and to the north of me in Buffles Hook is one of the most sort of stereotypical animals of Africa. The plains or the Birchall's zebra. I'm going to try and reposition. They've been playing a little bit of games with us, disappearing off. And we've just been talking about how the wind makes them unbelievably unsettled. But what happens is with all of the rustling, these animals rely mostly, they've got relative, they've got okay eyesight, but they mostly rely on their sense of smell and their sense of hearing. And what that means is on a windy day like today, they become exceptionally nervous. They can't hear properly, they can't smell properly, they can't rely on their two main senses that help to keep them alive. And they're all bunched together for safety. Look at that zebra there. It's got a missing tail. It's only got half a tail. The one on the left. Oh, I suppose most of you would be thinking that that probably came from something like a lion or a hyena or a lucky escape from predators. I'm sorry to tell you that most of the time a missing tail on a zebra has come from a fierce argument with another zebra. So I don't know what happened to that poor individual. Maybe it was this one over here. Probably not, but you never know. Zebra are notoriously bad-tempered. And although they don't look terribly dangerous, they do have seriously sharp incisor teeth and are also capable of delivering powerful kicks and that happens when the stallions fight for access to the mares it also happens with the females who have an incredibly strict hierarchy within the herd and what that means is that if a female steps out of line if she maybe forgets her place and goes ahead of one of the more dominant mares then she will receive a kick or a bite for her actions so a strict hierarchy maintained and all of the animals are gathering together. You can see the impala at the back there. Now we've just been speaking about the fact that our animals are moving away from us on this windy day. Paul, a lovely question coming through from you and welcome on this live safari experience. Now Paul has heard that zebra have terrible eyesight and is that the case? They don't have eyesight like we have eyesight, so they don't see as well as we do on the same level of definition. But you can try sneaking up on a zebra and see just how well that goes for you, because I can tell you right now, it is next to impossible. So their eyesight is not great, but they are very, very focused on any kind of movement. And then, of course, their sense of smell and hearing is good as well. I hate to distract from the zebra, but two impala males that are off to the left of them seem to be having something of a sparring session right at the back there. Where are they? Keep your eyes peeled. Maybe a little bit. Oh, there we go. Oh, I think they've been distracted by lunch. No, nope, we're just having a grooming session now. And that's lovely to see because we have just come out of the impala rutting season. And over the next few months on our live safaris, we're going to see a plethora of little tiny impala babies, probably around December, January. And the males have only recently stopped flinching every time another big male walks past them. And that's because during our May and June months, the testosterone levels are exceptionally high and the males are constantly, quite literally, butting heads and chasing females around. I have to say, I always feel a little bit for the impala ewes, the female impalas. They spend their lives either being chased by the males or pregnant, especially at this time of year where they have to try and find food to provide for themselves, or with little suckling lambs. 
we're going to see a lot of impala and a lot of animals lying down like that ram just was as they attempt to shelter from this gusting wind. Now that is an animal that's also supposedly not got the most fantastic of eyesight so, uh, to go back to Paul's question and again it's an animal that I have seen a spot movement at distances of 200-300 meters incredibly <laughs> for something that's not meant to be terribly good at seeing things I think they're incredibly sharp-eyed and that makes sense because whilst you can rely on your hearing and your sense of smell and the reactions of the herds and safety and numbers a short-sighted impala is not going to be very successful at surviving a predation but for now on this lazy Tuesday afternoon most of the animals out here are relatively safe if this wind continues as darkness falls it's going to be a completely different story as the nocturnal predators come into their element. Well, since our animals are slowly moving to the north of our traverse area onto Biffle's Hook, I'm sure you're wondering how Steph's cooking is going. One of the weirdest sentences I've ever said. Let's go and see how his egg is doing and whether or not it's ready for consumption. My egg is done. Look at this. Righty, everybody, let me just turn my sound on here. What we are looking at is some elephant dung. Sorry about that. Um, the bushwalk signal does tend to um, get a little bit distressed sometime. Perhaps the flavour coming off of um, Stefan's egg has freaked the bushwalk backpack out, or indeed maybe Jandre, the cameraman, has run away for fear of having to eat it. In here, we have quite a lot of elephant dung, and I was investigating it with my microscope when you came over to me. And it's lovely to have you with us, by the way. I mean, I, I, know, I know it was sudden, but it's very good to have you here in the tent. I was hoping maybe we'd find an insect or two. Uh, we can have a look there on the microscope. And there you can see what it is that is flavouring Steph's delicious meal. Mm. And as he says, it's just plain wood. It's wood shavings at the moment. There's no grass in this at all. It's largely just wood from the trees. Okay, come back to me now and let's have a look-see. I want to show you something about how dry it is. And you may be wondering about fires and that sort of thing. Come over here and we're going to snap to the rover. There is Ronald the rover now. Now, that's, that's the view he has. And as I said to you last time, there is water. As you can see, there's water there. We've pumped that water. Now, as I turn him round, I'm going to drive him... Oh, no, sorry, not that way. Let's go this way. There's his shadow. You can see Ronald's shape there. We're going to drive down into a dry riverbed, which in turn leads into a dry dam. And I'm going to show you how little grass and vegetation there is for the animals to eat. And so they're having to go further and further afield in the hopes of finding something nutritious to eat. Ronald, don't fall over, please. There we are. <laughs> Ronald is a he's, he's pretty good you know he does he does his job very well I think there we go some pretty rough terrain there but just look over the edge of the dam there and you can see there really is very little for any animal to eat it looks something like a desert landscape and that is on account of the fact that last year we had a very dry season uh, rainy season with about, ooh, I don't know, just over two inches of, no, less than two inches of rain, actually, of just under one inch of rain last year. And normally we have 600 millimeters or so, which is two feet of rain. So sorry, no, I'm talking absolute rubbish. We had 200 millimeters, which is 20 centimeters, which is about eight inches of rain. So that's all we had. And normally we have about 24 inches of rain. So we have much less than normal and we've just come out of what is a very dry season. Anyway, that's the story with the... <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm hearing that the egg is now ready for consumption again. Okay, let's go and look. We did it. We made an egg out of an orange. Look at the bottom over there. Look at how appetizing that looks. I can't wait to taste it. But first I have to make a utensil. And so I've got a piece of guari bush and I'm going to snip it off there and there. And there is my fork. 
And now the proof is in the pudding. Let's taste what this tastes like. Mmm. Excuse my table manners. Mmm. A nice citrusy, <coughs> a nice citrusy, eggy, elephant dung. Very good. That's very good actually, yeah? <laughs> Elizabeth, you've asked if this egg tastes vaguely dungish. Um, yes, Elizabeth, it does taste vaguely dungish, but on a nice, pleasant, herby feel. And I think the orange actually makes it taste quite nice. Um, you may be wondering why it didn't burn. The answer to that lies in the water that's contained in the, the skin of the citrus fruit. At a phase change, it doesn't change temperature. So from going from a liquid to a gas, it stays at 100 degrees centigrade. And that is how I'm able to cook the egg. The egg cooks at a far lower temperature than 100 and allows me... Oh, that's very good actually. should take it back to camp and tell Amanda, our chef, what it tastes like. <laughs> All right, now to clean up, we simply fold up, chuck it into the all-important pocket, make sure that we've put out our fire because on a day like today, we don't want any flames around and we carry on with our bushwalk. Just want to remind everybody, we are coming to you live, straight out of the Kruger National Park. And we're about as live as what you are at the moment, and so that is all done just for you. Alright, and while I get myself packed up and ready to go, I'm sure Brent has got an update for you. I just noticed something on the road here, I want to double check quickly. I thought I, thought I, thought I spied a leopard track, but it's not. It's a, it is actually a lion track, but that's not what I was looking at. But there is a lion track here. It's a bit old, but it's in some nice light, so we'll show it to you anyway. So this is one of the ways we find all these incredible creatures out there, is we follow their footprints. And uh, fortunately, at the moment, with this very dry climate we have, it's a little bit easier than, say, in the summer. Um, how's that look there, Brian? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I'm going to circle it. Now, it's a male lion track, and you can see if I do put my, make my track next to it, nearly the same size, not the biggest male lion. Male lion tracks can be the same size as my hand, about the size of a side plate. This isn't the biggest track. He's almost definitely part of our coalition of four males. And I wonder when he managed to sneak onto Juma. Uh, I wonder if he's maybe lying in the bushes there somewhere with the rest of the Nkuma pride. But until we're 100% sure, I think we should go on a little adventure. See if we can see where his footprints are heading. Now, it's difficult to age the track because of this wind today. But the fact that it's in a relatively good state probably means it is from uh, maybe last night or this morning. And male lions are able to cover incredible distance. They can walk over 25 kilometers in a single night. Now, often the big cats like to use the roads. Now, the reason for that is it's a lot of these roads are based on old game trails. And secondly, it's far nicer to walk down a nice road, not so many sticks, thorns than they would if we're walking through the bush. Now in the summer months they really like to walk, walk down the roads because of all the dew and lions don't particularly like being wet like most cats. So if they can, they'll walk down the road to avoid a dew and other moisture. Now it seems like Jamie has found one of the most beautiful antelopes we get out here in the African bush. Let's go to have a look.
absolutely one of the most beautiful antelope. In fact, if I had to tell you, I would say that this is probably the most attractive antelope that you could see on any kind of safari, or at least in this particular area. This is a Nyala, and with their large doe-like eyes and their graceful high step, they are almost like the catwalk models of the antelope world. And I can tell you something, this is a little male. A very little male, and the reason I can tell that, because male Nyala and female look totally different. Hello, little boy. But they only start to differentiate between the two when they reach sexual maturity. But if you look very closely, look between his ears, between sort of the middle of his forehead, and you'll see two tiny stumps just poking out of the top of his head. And those are his horns that are slowly growing up. So what we've got here is a teenage male Nyala. You can also tell it's a male by the fluffiness of the ridge of fur along his back. When he's fully grown, he will be absolutely magnificent. Male Nyala go a dark grey colour with beautiful tan stockings and large spiralling horns that grow out of the top of their heads. Now, unlike deer in sort of the North Americas and Europe, the horns of antelope are made entirely from bone rather than from hardened capillaries and blood vessels that make up antlers. So that is why the big difference between our antelope and your deer. Look at him slowly moving through, giving a perfect demonstration of just how tricky Nyala, be, can, Nyala can be to spot. Ow. Big welcome to any viewers that have joined us for the first time. You are on live safari here in the middle of the African bush. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Viam on camera with me and along with the rest of the safari live team we're going to be searching for all kinds of magical things here in the African bush like these beautiful graceful Nyala that have disappeared. Hold on one moment, we're going to go forward a little bit and see if we can't get another view of them for you. Now, 